I'm Amanda. And I'm Mel. And this is the Road Back Home podcast. Where we share real conversations about midlife, sobriety, and sisterhood. What we're actually going to talk about today is something that came up in the aftermath of our last episode in um, post-production after I sent you the um, the the episode after we recorded it to have a listen. Yeah. Would you like to share what the experience was like for you? So Amanda had sent me the link after we recorded um, the last episode. And of course, I found myself sitting down, nitpicking, um, you know, just being very uh, self-critical. And, uh, and and I I suppose it was kind of <laughs> it was kind of laughing along because I felt that uh, for a big chunk of the podcast my contribution was basically yeah 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 so you know I pointed that out but it was just interesting that. Upon listening, rather than, you know, honing in on the areas where I did have, you know, useful things to bring to the podcast and, um, you know, insights and I shared some things and offered my vulnerability and things that I should have praised myself for. Instead, I focused on um, the elements I was very, you know, just critical with myself. Mm. So that brought us to the question of, you know, is that, why am I doing that? Is that like, is it like a self-sabotage? Is it, is it a perfectionism? Mm. Um, Would I have chosen to say things another way to please the listener rather than just allow myself to safely and unapologetically be who I am? So it just brought that question yeah, yeah. I think you, you, you were very self conscious. I think after listening to that, and um, it, it was so interesting for me to hear your feedback because you were um, conscious about things that I didn't even hear when I listened. You know, did not even hear. And so it's very interesting where um, sometimes when we're self conscious about something and we draw attention to it, assuming that if I heard it, saw it, felt it, well, then it must be true. And also others must be aware of it as well. And then we draw attention to it. And the other person's like, God, I didn't even notice. It's like that thing, like when you, when you have the spot on your face and you, yeah. you're you so self-conscious and you walk yeah. into someone and you're like, oh, let me just introduce you to Fred. <laughs> and, you know, and the other person's like, I, I didn't, I didn't even see it. But now that you've pointed it out, I see it. But yeah, you were asking, what is that? And I said, well, that, that's basically perfectionism. It's it's a defense mechanism, basically. It's it's you feel self-conscious and hence vulnerable. Um, and when that happens, we saying, well, this these are all the things you did wrong. You yeah. feel that way because these things and not just instead of just sitting in the feeling of discomfort, it's uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. It's really uncomfortable listening to yourself back. I know so many people who can't even listen to their own voice they can't even hear their own voice yeah and you related to that as well didn't you because you you then start to think of all the way perfectionism shows up in your life I did and and then I started as I normally do going down the rabbit hole of confusion and I'm like hmm like you know let's define it can you define you know perfectionism and I think everything has a definition but I think that it's hard to figure out if that's what is standing in the way unless you have somebody who's willing to walk you through a process to figure it out, right? You started asking me some great questions, which we'll Mm. give an example of in a little bit. But like even this morning, right? So um, I I have a cleaning company who comes over twice a month. And I think there will be listeners who will definitely relate to this and I'm sure you will yourself Amanda but you nearly know what you're going to say yeah 
cleaning for the cleaners. Yeah. Let's let's talk about cleaning for the cleaners. <laughs> so we're paying a company to come in and clean. So what do we do before they arrive? We clean for them. Mm-hmm. Like it's literally one of the most stressful mornings in my house because I need everyone out of their bedrooms. I need to make sure that your beds are at least somewhat made. Pick up your underwear off the floor. Pick up your socks. Get everything into the laundry. And like get the dishes into the dishwasher. What What exactly? Like Frank looked at me one day and, and you know, cautiously because he's a wise man asked me you know what exactly are you paying for just out of curiosity because you're leaving the house you know in in a way that they walk in and probably just put the music on and dance for three hours so and then you know I I asked myself is that am I doing that like there's two reasons why I might be doing it one reason is because I want them to spend their time getting into the nooks and crannies Right. I don't want clutter to be in their way and taking mm-hmm. up their time. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel if I've done all that, well, then, you know, they can get into the corners and under the tables and under the beds and behind the couch and the places that we just generally as full time working parents and crazy family lives don't always have time to do or mm-hmm. maybe not even the will to do it. It's not my favorite thing to do pulling out you know, couches and beds and when I could be doing something else. So um, Mm. there's that reason, which feels practical to me. Mm. And then there is, am I afraid that the cleaners are going to judge me? Mm. Am I afraid the cleaners are going to come in and say, Jesus, what a dirty bitch. Mm. And I know (laughs) that that's not going to happen. Because here I come in, by the way, justifying to the audiences that I have a very clean house. Did everyone hear that? (laughs) (laughs) I learned very quickly that there is this kind of widely practiced judgment where Mm. women specifically are judged based on how clean their houses are. I I think one of the things that kept arising, the question, whether we were talking about perfectionism and whether we were talking about people pleasing, let's say, the question that arose for you was, how do I know if my choices are coming from a place of perfectionism or my conditioning? You know, so it could be people pleasing, however it's manifesting. But it's basically, how do I know if my choices are coming from my conditioning or if they are aligned with my true values, like who I truly am and who I actually want to be in the world. Like, how do I know? Yeah. You know, and I think this is a huge thing when we are dealing with our conditioning and when we are deconditioning, that is a kind of a not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It becomes very confusing. It's like, well, what? What parts of me do I let go of? Like what parts of how I show up in the world do I let go of? And what do I get to keep? It's a question that I I have heard a lot of people asking. And I remember asking so, so many questions like that myself. Like I'm going back now to 2009 in my first year in college. And I was studying, um, I was studying for a degree in psychotherapy and we were in our personal development module and we had just started and we were learning about um, Carl Rogers. Um, uh, anyway, it doesn't matter what the, what school of thought, but there was there's a model um, real self, ideal self. Basically, your authentic self, who you would be if there was nobody looking and your ideal self, which is almost like your social self. It's an aspirational self. It's the self we think we should be, right? you know, and it broke my brain in that moment to even have it presented that there were two selves, two differently motivated selves. Another way that before I knew that the way that I used to like, I would present myself because um, I was also in therapy at the time. And I remember presenting it as like, I feel like my character and my personality are two different things. You know, if I was free to make my own choices, if I was, you know, if, if I didn't think I had an audience, I, I'm not sure I would be the same. I don't, I'm not sure I would make the same choices that I make 
knowing that I am being perceived. Yeah. And that really did cause a lot of internal conflict in me. And there's actually a term in it, a term for it, and that is the state of incongruence. Incongruence. Yeah. So incongruence in psychology is basically a misalignment between the real self and the ideal self. And hence, the person who is in a state of incongruence is kind of struggling with self-image, like the, the daily actions of the, the conditioned self, you might say, might be very much um, in contrast with the real self. Like if I, if I really believed I was free to choose, yeah. like if I really, really thought that I could choose and that, that nobody would fall out with me, wouldn't get in trouble, wouldn't feel shame, all those things, what would I choose here? If I was honest, in other words, yeah. what, would I, what would I choose? And I remember when that was presented in class and I put my hand up and I'll never forget my, my tutor's face when I asked the question. I put my hand up and he says, yes, Amanda. And I said, OK, so if there's an ideal self and a real self, which one of me is married? Oh, Amanda, I remember you told me that. Yeah. Oh it, it, my God. Yeah, because I, I, it was a total crisis. I was like, I don't know which one of me is driving the bus. Which one of me is making the, the decisions? Because I secretly knew that I wasn't happy, but it was secret. I was like, I was secret. So the secret self, when I'm teaching people journaling, is surfacing the secret self. Wow. What would you say if you were actually honest and weren't afraid? <gasps> like, what's the truth? Mm. You know, and not very often we're hiding that truth because we, on some level, don't believe that it will be acceptable. Well, I think we're also hiding it <clears throat> because we know that it would turn our worlds upside down. Oh, there's no doubt. At some and point, it, yeah. You, well, for sure, because, you know, coming out in your truth is going to directly impact everyone and everything in it. Yeah. Because suddenly then you might decide that you're no longer tolerating people um, and behaviors that you were tolerating as your, uh, what did you call it? What's the opposite of ideal self? There's the ideal self and the real self, or else we could think of it as our conditioned self yeah. and our actual self. You know, the free, you, you've studied it as, as in the free child and the adapted child in transactional yeah. analysis. It's that yeah. too. Yeah, I, I mean, I, it, I imagine um, it would just turn everything on its head and probably end up um, in, a, in a better place. However, how brave, you know, mm. of a person does it take to actually live in their truth in a world where everyone is so deeply judged, you know? And mm -hmm. it's interesting that you should send me a book. Mm -hmm. And I just started reading it this weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, that is aligning so beautifully with this conversation. And that is Untamed by Glennon Doyle. Yes. And, you know, she literally, there's a sentence in the book that I'm just after pulling up and it is um, her mother speaking to um, the woman that Glennon fell in love with. Mm -hmm. And she says to her, her um, she says to Abby, I've not seen my daughter this alive since she was 10 years old. Yeah. And because, you know, I guess that's when Glennon says it's around that age when we decide to let the world tell us who we are. Up yeah. until then, and Amanda, do you know what? This is why I love working with young kids. Mm. I I bask in their freedom to be unapologetically who they are. They haven't learned what the world wants them to be yet. And it's the most beautiful thing to experience because we all lose it at some point. Mm. And build ourselves off of, you know, expectations. And um, yeah, maybe that's why I, I feel so much more comfortable 
in the company of carefree kids than I do in a room full of adults most of the time. Yeah. You know, maybe they bring me back to that place where um, I could, you know, start all over and make decisions based on my real truth, you know. And by me, I, I speak for many of us, you know. It's... um. Do you know it's, what it is as well, I imagine? You can say to a kid, today I'm a unicorn. Yep. And they'll go, oh, okay. And then tomorrow you'll be like, today I'm a giraffe. And they'll go, okay. They'll never go, but hold on, I thought you were a unicorn. Yeah, yeah. And so what we want instead of um, black and white, let's say, or absolutes, what we're looking for instead of absolutes is clarity. Clarity will get you so much closer to where you, how you want to feel than some kind of absolute. Because today, you know, today I like tea, tomorrow it's coffee. You know, and that doesn't mean I suddenly don't like tea. <clears throat> it just means that, you know, we're fluid beings. Well, you know what, Amanda, hearing you say that as a person who tends to have varying and transient thoughts and opinions hmm. uh, but you know based on a, a, you know a, an array of things that's that's quite comforting because sometimes I can tend to mix that up in myself for just being confused yeah you know where I'm like hmm. it, and you know it's why I don't tend to have a very strong at least a public strong stance on things I tend to lean more towards Switzerland when it comes to uh, opinions, um, particularly when people are demanding an opinion. What side are you on? You know, which like I hate questions like what's your favorite color? I hate that question yeah. because I don't have a favorite color that is constant. You know, mm. it's you know, I change my nail color based on what what mood I'm in. You know, today I might love a deep shade of purple and tomorrow I want maybe a dark red or, you know, a light blue next week. I don't like to be held to one particular belief or opinion. Yeah. I think that's the, you know, the wild side, you know, the, the wild child in me, um, you know, kind of poking her head up to say, hey, you don't have to conform to a specific thing. You know, yeah, I, I'm giving you permission to change your mind. By the way, that's one of my favorite things about you, Amanda. You've always um, on some, I don't even know if it was always conscious. I think it is conscious now. But you were the first nonconformist that I ever met in my life. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, I have memories of you resisting um, things that community or society told you you should do. And if you didn't feel that, you know, you wanted to do those things or that, you know, that spoke to who you were, you didn't do it. Would you agree with that? You know, as you're saying that to me, what happens in my brain is I, I, I don't know if I am, um, like if I chose that or the fact that in in some ways, like being, a kid in the 80s, like because I was a fat kid, right? And very often I think that it it didn't allow me to conform in so many ways because when I was a kid in the 80s, like I I couldn't dress like my peers. Yeah. Couldn't conform. Even if I tried to, I couldn't. I just could not fit in in those ways. In my mind, that was me not fitting in. Yeah. And and there was nothing I could do about it. Like, I, I couldn't change my physical manifestation. Like, I couldn't change the body I had as a child. Now, I thought I could. I thought I was supposed to. I th in fact, I thought that was my job. You know, and that was my work in the world was to change that body, to change it and to make it more acceptable. And I think what developed as a result of that was a kind of a resentment. And mm -hmm. then a kind of rebelliousness. Re yes, at, yeah. Like exactly what Glennon says in her book. And I resist, I have resisted reading that book for so long for God knows why. But I just love the simplicity with which she does boil down these things where she says, you know, whether it is a, a, obedience or rebellion, it's still a cage. 
you're yeah. still not free because you're still reacting to the expectation. Mm. You're either, you know, complying with it or saying, fuck you. Because you mm. can't, you know, so there's so much of my messiness, let's say, as a human, I could not comply. And also being, I don't know if I'm if I'm neurodivergent, I suspect that I am. So my mm. brain didn't necessarily work the way my teachers wanted it to work. Yeah. And I, I couldn't necessarily. Um, I, I, I couldn't necessarily show up the way like my strengths. In other words, were kind of like pathologized the, the ways that I needed to learn in school were a little bit coloring outside the lines. I mean, I remember my art teacher in secondary school and she couldn't stand me because I wasn't obedient in the way she needed me to be. She wanted me to art a certain way. Mm. And that's just not the way I arted. I wasn't interested in art as a, a technical ability. You know, I wasn't interested in learning the discipline of art. Right. It was an emergency for me. It was a vehicle of self-expression. Yeah. And I wish that my art, you know, our art teachers in school, or at least that art teacher, had have been more interested in the expression coming through the individual as opposed to having a standard and that standard being the Renaissance mm. and expecting you, all her students, to have the same appreciation and discipline and aspiration that we would all sketch our way into our A grade. It's so a, true. I mean, I remember, um, I mean, first of all, I remember Irish class being boring, which it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be boring repetitious but I also remember thinking and talk about perfectionism I remember thinking this isn't fair I can't draw I can learn German verbs I can learn French verbs I can go home and practice algebra formulas and mm -hmm. I can come in and I can ace my test I can't learn perspective if I don't get it I can't mm -hmm. You can't put a bowl of fruit in front of me <clears throat> and I and expect that I can draw some some people just have that brain. I didn't have that. So being graded on something that I didn't even have the ability to practice because I did not have the ability. I still don't. Yeah. Felt so unfair to me. Yeah. So yeah. I remember seeking, um, you know, basically seeking ways to get a good grade in that class in other ways, you know, which were absolutely disgustingly people pleasing yeah and and my my path was more kind of like I resented the fact that I couldn't get good grades in the things that I was good at so we don't take these this is not maybe it's different today but when we were in school these things were not taken into an account there was one way catered to a certain learning style and if that learning style mm -hmm. just so happened to be in your wheelhouse well then you got good grades that's how I see it but it also affected the rest of your life. You got good grades, which meant that you got the rewards, which meant you got the recognition, which meant it boosted your confidence, which meant you got into a good college. Like yeah. it had devastating effects yeah. on some people who did have learning difficulties and yeah. it wasn't recognized. You were just a dunce. So, yeah, that it, it's so I guess that's really how it manifested in me was that I discovered very early on that I didn't fit in a lot of the. um blueprints for how I was supposed to be as a child, as a girl, as a student. You know, mm -hmm. I just didn't, I, I didn't fit the, the prototype. And rather than, well, I, I guess in many ways I did try and fit and then I would fail. Um, and then this resentment just kind of like grew inside me that that made me resist and become an antagonist then and and so what you see as a nonconformist was really a protest it was it was me in pain saying mm. well fuck you I'm not even going to try now you know I'm going to be me whether you like it or not and and that me never it wasn't necessarily coming from a place of self-esteem it was literally from a place of of it was just as insecure yeah. And funny, as a kid, I didn't see that. I saw like, you know, 
much Nobody as I saw it. Everybody no. just saw Troublemaker. Well, and, and I was afraid of it. I was afraid yeah. of it a lot of the time because I knew that it was going to cause, you know, uh, arguments or, you know, whatever it was going to cause. <clears throat> but at the same time, I remember looking at it from my own place, which, you know, I, I, I it's funny. I have a certain memory of myself as being kind of a bit of an anxious kid. Um, and I've asked, I've definitely spoken to ma'am about this a little bit. And I don't know that she has the same memory of me being anxious. Maybe I hid it well. I don't know. But I remember looking at you thinking, oh my God, like how brave must you be to say no to something that you're being told to do? There's no way in a million years I would have done that. I was a yes, I will do it. Do you need me to do it twice? You know, <laughs> I, I'll stick to the rules. Um, oh, sure, for God's sakes, Amanda, I remember things I used to do as a kid just to keep the peace and keep everyone mm. happy. And and that was me creating, or so I thought, a safe space for me to exist in. Exactly. Because I, I was so uncomfortable with conflict and, um, you know, all that it brought. But come here, shall we delve into a bit of process work? Yes, yes. Before we do, I have to I have to share a little story about the word obedience. OK, right. As we say, like the, the two expressions, let's say, of of not being free in terms of like Lennon's book is, you know, obedience and, and rebellion. She said they're both cages. Yeah, um, there I have a small deck of cards. They're an angel card deck. You might you know, people might know them. They're they're very small, like um, rectangle uh, white cards and they just have words on them and then little angel um, just little angels beside them so I use these in my workshops right and at the end of every workshop I always say before we wrap it up let's ask the angels for a blessing for each of our processes that we have you know kind of like externalized and they now exist as a physical thing in the world in in this circle between us so I say let's leave our processes with a blessing and I pass this bowl around and there's one card in that entire deck and the card is obedience. And from the very first time I went through that card deck and found that card, I was like, I don't want, I don't like that that card is in there. I wanted to take it out. I wanted to remove that card. And funny, anytime anybody pulls that card, and it's always women in my workshops, any women that have pulled that card, every single one of them, if not said, oh, like it's the unwanted card. They're like, fuck that. Or they might put it back and be like, give me another one. I don't want that one. Nobody wants the obedience card. And there'll be very few people that or they might go interesting, you know, hmm, that's interesting. But nobody goes, yes. You know, <laughs> so pe people will get the card that says playfulness and they'll go, yeah, they get the obedience card. And everyone's like, fuck that, because what's lying behind it is everyone is saying, fuck that. I'm tired of being obedient. Like obedience is the whole thing. Like or. They might be somebody, for example, like you, who are like, I've spent my entire life being obedient. No, fuck off. That's not a blessing. That's a curse. Right. What, what, what the, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Or Keep somebody going. like me will get the cards and I'd be like, no, fuck off. I've spent my entire life failing to be obedient. There's no way of me being obedient in this world. I just exist in a brain and in a body that of like fundamentally doesn't work the way it is expected to. And so I have a reaction to the card. So I want to take that card out. But I know that that is me interfering with the process. That's me policing. That's me playing God. That's me mm. policing the angels. So yeah. because they are angel cards, I trusted all along. I was like, there must be a reason why that card is in there. So I'm going to leave it in there. I'm going to trust it. But I would brace myself. Every time I pass the bowl around, I'd be like, oh, please, please, nobody get the obedience cards, please. So what I learned there was that the original word, the, the original meaning of obedience or obey is to listen and like to take direction. Right. And the opposite of it is to be deaf towards. Right. Now, the idea is that you are, like, to be disobedient is to be deaf, deaf towards, to not take guidance, not take direction, right? Which is very interesting. As a disobedient kid, that's kind of like what I would 
think I would have been labelled as is disobedient. And you was you were obedient. So, but here's the interesting piece is that, so take guidance or direction from what? What are you taking guidance or direction from? Is it something like whose will is it? Is it your will? Is it will outside yourself? Is it external? Is it internal? So we have been trained to be obedience to obe- to or to be a- obedient towards the authority that is maybe parental, whatever the authoritarian is, teachers, priests, whatever it is. So the authorities being basically these mortal people who are just humans like us, but have some higher, you know, they're higher up on this food chain as such, right? And so we are trained to be obedient towards them. And any kind of resistance towards that is disobedience. But the true meaning and invitation for obedience is to obey your higher purpose, your greater knowing, your own moral guidance. It is your spiritual guidance, that which is true for you. And so when the when the angels offer us, they say, you know, may you be obedient. What they mean is, may you march to the beat of your own drum. Oh, well, that changes the word entirely. Yeah. And disobey that which is not right. Mm. Disobey that which is acting as power, but is not power. That is disobey that which is abusing power. So it's like this idea of being an obedient person from a spiritual standpoint means that I, as somebody, let's say, who was, and I wasn't necessarily resisting authority because I was following my own trueness. I wouldn't have been resisting anything. I just would have been following what I believe to be right. I would have been just following what is true for me as opposed to reacting to you for expecting of me something that just is not within my capacity to deliver or yeah. not within my nature to deliver. So I want to share that about. So when that angel card is in that bowl and I'm so happy I left it in there now that I understand it, when I see that card coming around, the reaction is still the same. People still react to it, but it's an opportunity for me then to share this idea that obedience is not a demand. It's a blessing. Like, may you be obedient. May you take guidance from your own spiritual truth. So we've created a tool for you, for the listeners, um, to help with, given that this um, conversation that we've been having kind of kept kept coming back to this question, uh, the confusion about, you know, um, like, am I doing, you know, am I about to make a decision or making a choice here that really is a reflection of what's best for me in this moment? Or is it driven by some part of my conditioning? Like, am I acting out of fear? Is this people pleasing? Is this perfectionism? Is it all habits? And what we, what I said I would do is kind of like give you a list of questions that you can ask that will help you really get clarity because it is hard to know whether we're acting in alignment with what we truly need in a situation or if we are reacting based on our conditioning. And so this uh, tool, it's a worksheet, it's basically a set of questions. So when you are unsure if a decision you're making is what's best for you or if it's part of your conditioning, take a sec. And that's a three-step process that you can use that will help you assess the situation so you can have clarity. It'll help you protect your energy. And then it will also help you get more creative with how you are meeting your needs. Yeah, I love that. Uh, You know me, I love a good formula to put into action, you know, when... uh, when I'm confused about something and, you know, I think this comes up for me a lot, Amanda, is trying to figure out, you know, what is my motivation and what is my end goal here? So I'm very excited about this. That's exactly what this is. And I use this all the time and it has put out so many fires in my life because as we said here, what we're not looking for is any kind of absolutes. We're just looking for clarity. Yeah. You know, 
Um, okay, so step one, uh, take a sec. Uh, SEC is a, an acronym that I'm using. Take a sec, S-E-C. Um, the first one is you're going to assess the situation. That's getting clarity. First of all, what is the situation? Right. So just identify the situation and uh, write that down. And this worksheet will be made available. I'll tell you how you can get it when we're done running through this. And the first question you're going to ask yourself is what need am I trying to meet through this action? That's it. Okay. What need am I trying to meet? Now, you'd probably be like, well, I don't know. Luckily for you, I have a list of needs. Ah, now, that's helpful. Yeah. So think of this as a cheat sheet. And it's almost like this is, things like this are so obvious when it comes to like, what do you need? We go up into our heads and be like, what do I need? And I have found it much easier to go to a sheet and run your finger down the list of needs and your body will tell you when you hit the right one. Now, it could be several needs. So it doesn't have to be one need. You know, so what need am I trying to meet? Get out of your head. Don't even worry about it. Just run your your finger down this sheet and those needs will start to be like, oh, my God, it's that one. It's a need for order. And that mm. will give you so much insight and clarity. You are already more clear now because, you know, you're identifying what need you're trying to meet through or needs through this choice you're about to make. Uh, we're still in step one. We're still looking for clarity. The second question is, OK, well, is this the only way to meet that need right now? Right. The thing that I'm about to do or that I have done or that I did do, you can use this in retrospect. Like, is this the only way that I could meet this need? And then you will know. Um, you know, it'll either be a yes or a no. You know, and if it's a no, if it's a straight up no, there's no other way I can meet this need. Ask yourself again, <laughs> like, you know, is that are you true? sure? <laughs> yeah. Like, is that really true? You know, is it really true that this is the only way you can meet your need for order right now? Yeah. Step two, then we're into the E, protect your energy. So it's just another question. Yeah. Is this action that I've decided to take to meet this need is this going to leave me feel energized or drained? Oh, I love that question. And again, you're going to let your body answer this question. Mm. I'm going to go into a big rigmarole. So it's just like, imagine yourself now going through with your intended action. What does your body, does your body feel, does it feel light? Does it feel heavy? And you know, don't you, you know that feeling in your body where it's just yeah. like the bracing. Oh God, no. You know, your body will tell you how that choice you're about to make or did make, whatever, the impact on your energy. And then you check in again and say, okay, is this the best use of my energy in this given moment? Or is there a better use of my energy that honors my truth? So for example, instead of like, is this the best use of my energy? It might be like, like, is cleaning the room the best use of my energy right now? Mm -hmm. Or is there a better use of my energy? Like would taking a bath doing a bit of yoga, like going for a walk, like would that be a better use of my energy given that, you know, my body will either want to feel energized or drained, you know, like, mm -hmm. so there might be, you might be like, oh no, it is good use of my energy to clean the room right now. But given that your ultimate goal is your, you know, well-being, mm -hmm. you know, it might be harder to not clean the room and to take a bath that might be harder but right. ultimately it will be more restorative right yeah. so that's what you're really asking here is it the best use of my energy I'm actually I'm asking myself all of these I'm inputting this in my head in my own scenario right now it's very interesting mm. and then another uh, uh, question to ask around your energy and say okay think about this is meeting the need I have identified in this way, is that ignoring any other important needs? Like, is this, is anything else going to be sacrificed? You know, so for example, we're saying like, um, um, <clears throat> so you might have a need for order, 
which would be compelling you to clean the room. But what if you also have a need for ease that's getting thrown under the bus because the need for order is taking precedence? So yeah. it's really important to understand this and say, OK, well, I, I understand that I have a need for order and cleaning the room would really help me meet that need. But is my need for ease like can that be valid, too? And you don't have to make any decisions on how you're going to resolve this right now, but it is important to take it into account mm. to say, you know, well, you know, get, get, can I give equal weight to these needs now that I know what needs are on the table? And then in step three, when we get there, we can be more creative and say, OK, well, how can I meet my need for order and ease? I was going to ask that. I was going to ask, can they be can it be a shared need? That's where you yes, that's where we get creative, because now you're now you're detaching from the the urgency, let's say, of the the need for, or, you know, order feels like a more urgent need, not because it is, but because the need for ease is more socially shamed. Yes. Yeah. You know what I mean? So we invalidate the need for ease instead mm. of actually owning the fact that, you know, my need for support right now, like that's really valid. And the your conditioning is what's getting in the way of that by saying you shouldn't, you should be able to do this by yourself. You shouldn't need help. Yeah. So that, that's why we're getting clear. All needs, there will be some who maybe ha carry more weight, but we have to ask ourselves, you know, is that fair? Is that fair to my need for ease? You know, because here's the thing, an unmet need is going to haunt you. Yeah. Right. So that's why we have to be aware of them. Now, the other interesting thing here, you could say, like, is meeting my identified need in the way that I am intending to go about it, sacrificing or ignoring any other pressing needs that I might have? Or if you're in a situation with somebody else, you might think, well, is my need for order um, maybe you know, getting in the way of somebody else's need for something else. So you're not responsible for anybody else's needs, let's say. But it's helpful to consider that everybody involved in this transaction or interaction will have their own needs. And so that kind of bit of empathy can go a long way. So it's almost like, you know, am I going to force my will? Like, is, is me forcing my will going to deprive somebody of having their needs met in a way that their unmet needs now is going to cause conflict in the situation? So even though I might get what I want, I kind of will, there'll be a payback. So can I, can I throw in with a quick yeah. interjection? So I'm just so that I can make sure that I'm understanding, like yeah. just in, in my own situation, let's say um, my need for tidying the kids room let's just go back to to that need for order i'm looking for order and the action is tidying the room yeah. whereas their need could be the need to learn to do it themselves and by me acting on my need of order i'm depriving them of the opportunity to learn to do it themselves is is that a is that yes a, it a, could be that, that like they their need in that moment could be for autonomy Yes. Yeah. And by so absolutely. Yeah. And by, you know, honoring um, my need without considering their theirs, I'm doing them a disfavor. Yes. And you're leaving them with unmet needs, which ultimately backfires on you because their unmet needs will haunt mm -hmm. them and they'll keep <laughs> using and behaviors. They will, to, they will haunt to, me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they were so it's just worth, you know, it's just worth having a need consciousness. And it will be really yeah. useful to start using that language in the house in terms of saying, well, what what do you need right now? And chances are they'll give you the action. Like, I need you to leave me alone. Like that, that's the action. And that would meet your need for what? Yeah. Independence, autonomy. And the best thing you can do if you're not going to consult with the person is take an educated guess. And again, go down mm. through the list. Don't leave mm. it up to your head. Do not do this work in your head. Don't guess your needs. Don't even guess your feelings in your head. Yeah. Because your head is where all the conditioning is. Your body is where the truth is. 
And so when you use your body, the tip of your finger to literally run down these lists of feelings and needs, your body will tell you ding, 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 when the finger is on the right one. You know, I love that idea of opening up this conversation. And I immediately think I have one child who would be all in for this and who would love to use that language. And he's definitely the one that I would try it out on first. And I have another child who would definitely look at me like I needed to be committed. So it, it's also a case of, you know, I think I might try it out, you know, at yeah. least on, on the willing party first. <laughs> See how well, that goes. It. Th- that's it. Because here's the thing as well, though, when you are accurate, when you become get actual accuracy in terms of guessing somebody's needs, it actually has the effect on their nervous system of calming them down. Yeah. So in terms of autonomy, you might say, you might be looking through this list and you say, okay, so I want the room clean. And what might his need be in this moment? Well, it might be a need for choice. It Mm. might be a need for freedom. It might be a need for space. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to looking at these lists, actually, because I want to go through and and see what the selection is. So this falls under E, Amanda, in the acronym. So this yeah? is you protecting your energy. Now what we're doing is we are checking in with ourselves to say, now that I know what need I'm trying to meet and how I have kind of decided to go about it, mm-hmm. I'm going to just check, is this the best use of my energy? Mm. You know, are there other ways I could meet these needs? Mm-hmm. Or is me kind of like meeting this need in this way kind of stepping on any other needs whether they're mine or somebody else's yeah right and once you have identified everything that's at stake then we move into step three now we get creative we say okay what are some ways that I could meet these needs That would help me feel the way I want to feel. And then you're going to the list again. How do I want to feel? And you might realize that actually how I I just want to feel peaceful. Yeah, I want to or I I might want to feel, you know, like calm. Yeah, you know, what might make me feel calm or I might want to feel content or whatever it is. Now, I do have have a question for you, right, because. You know, just learning this for the first time and, of course, mm-hmm. going into detail about it makes it feel like it's going to be a very time consuming activity, let's call it. Is this something that when you start practicing it becomes something that you can do, you know, faster than the first time you did it? Yes. So I'll tell you what this is. Like. This is basically a language. Yeah. This is a new for, this is a communication. It opens up communication within yourself and it opens up communication around you, right? So this is a way of moving through the world in a way that is, um, it, it's a need consciousness. So this is a consciousness and we have to check our perfectionism here because it's going to be frustrating. This is not a per- something you do perfectly. This is something that uh, you said the words, this is a practice. And it is literally just the practice of checking in with myself, getting clarity. What am I actually trying to do here? What is at stake? How am I going to preserve my energy? Like, how do I get the best value from my energy here instead of just trying to force my will on the world? Mm. You know, um, and then deal with the, with the payback of that, the, you know, because that will backfire every single time. You get your way, but at what cost? Yeah. Right. So then we move into step three and that's the creativity. Okay. So what are some ways now that I know all the needs that are at stake? Let me get creative. Is there a way that I could or or some kind of response I can put out into the world or engage in that would meet? these needs in a way that it's going to help me feel better like the way I want to feel what would some examples be of like getting creative about it okay so we take the example of let's go with the example of the um the order in the room so I have a need for order I have a need for calm I've you also identify you know I have a need for efficiency I have a need for these things how I would like to meet that need or how I have always met that need or how I have always believed like a successful strategy has always been 
that all the rooms are tidy, yeah. right? But now we know that it also sometimes comes with conflict. So what are the needs being met? Like, what might the needs be over there? Let's just say the need might be for autonomy, right? Mm -hmm. So we have two teenage boys here. Of course, the need for autonomy is nearly always going to be there, mm -hmm. right? So how can I, given that I know what my needs are and what my best guess about what their needs are, what might be a suitable compromise here? Like, mm -hmm. Because first you're going to brainstorm. So like you do it because it's your life and it's your situation. What might be yeah. some ideas? Just get creative. Throw them out there. They don't even have to be realistic. Yeah. Right now. We're opening. Yeah. We're opening yeah. up the channels. Like we're brainstorming. Well, it's funny. What I first thought of was, you know, I love the idea of compromise. And I thought, well, you know what? Maybe I don't have to straighten up the whole room. Maybe I can say, you know what, I'm going to take the laundry out of the room and that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to make the bed. I'm not going to straighten out their desks. I'm just going to take the laundry out of the room. And the other 10 minutes that I would have spent in there, I'm going to spend in the bath. OK, so that's maybe one compromise so that I can, you mm -hmm. know, I can tend to the need for order and calm in a compromised way. And it feels creative because I wouldn't have thought of doing that before. It's usually, and you've often said this to me before, I'm usually, you know, headed to self-care, you know, post burnout rather than doing it as a means of preventative measures. Exactly. It's usually an emergency. It's usually yeah. repair. You're yes. usually in repair, recovery mode. So yes. great. The, yeah, the idea of, you know, doing a bit of labor alongside a little bit of self-care actually sounds very practical and makes me feel a bit stupid that I never thought of that before. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's now let's kind of like bring, bring it in. Let's take our best guess, right? Mm -hmm. Our best guess. Let's just say you didn't even consult with, with, with the boys. Our best guess here that their need might be some form of autonomy. Yeah. Right. So how, how would your, creative solution now be meeting their need how would that be beneficial to them like how 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 do you think that would play in well I feel that it would play in in that I am not doing all the work for them in the room I'm leaving things for them to do I'm leaving their space more alone than I was before yeah. And if it's things like their desks and their beds it's kind of almost like you're you're allowing them to have some domain yeah. Yeah, it's you it's know? funny because, you know, one of my kids often says to me, you know, and this is a very typical kid thing to say, and I think probably some adults as well. He always says, what is the point in making a bed when you're just going to get back into it? And he also claims that he feels cozier getting into the bed when it hasn't been made. So okay. I should listen to that. If that's if, if that's what he wants I and it's his bed, there's no reason outside of my own uh, compulsion um, to make his bed. Mm. Yeah. So for him, it might be, you know, a need there might be, you know, the need for um, a bit of messiness, maybe. <clears throat> yeah. Or, or it, that would even fall under autonomy. It's almost like I know how I like my bed. Like it doesn't bother me that my bed isn't made. And yeah. so if it was up to me, I wouldn't make my bed. That's literally autonomy. If it was up to me. Mm. Right. So the need is for autonomy. Yeah. Right. So the last question in this form is, OK, well, now that I have a creative solution, do I need to communicate this with anybody? Do I need to make any requests? And how will I do this? So let's imagine you go into the boys room and you say, do you know what? I've realized that. When I ask, you know, my desire for a tidy room is actually about me feeling on top of shit. Yeah. It's about order. <laughs> yeah. So I've decided, given that I'm the one who does laundry here, that the best use of my time is to come in here, do a whip round, take out your laundry. And I'm going to leave the, your domain, your dominion in this space is your bed and your desk. You get to decide how those two places wouldn't be my preference. Wouldn't be my preference. My <laughs> preference would be a made bed. My preference would be a tidy desk. Mm. But that is your space. 
And you're old enough now to know what you like. I trust yeah. that you, I trust you when you say that you prefer an unmade bed. So I'm going to let go of those spaces. So when I come into your room, I'm going to pick up the clothes off the floor and I'm going to take my laundry out of here because that's my job. And I'm going to just leave you to your desk and leave you to your bed and let you be the boss of those things. And then I'm going to have a bubble bath. Yeah. And then it's like, and then I feel like this, this is a way for me to meet my needs and for you to get to have a little bit of authority in your own space. So I have to tell you, so my body, and this happens to me a lot, something else you know about me, um, is that my body reacts very easily to things. I literally feel like a weight was just taken off my shoulders. Just you walking me through that. That is because, exactly how this oh, should feel. Well, it's, it's incredible because in the beginning, I won't lie. I was a little bit nervous because I felt you were going to take that from me. Exactly. <laughs> Not that you were going to take it from me, but that you were going to show me a formula that was going to um, maybe force me to look at um, what I was doing as something I should undo. So I love the idea yeah. that there is actually a compromise and a way that I could do this and actually feel like I'm taking care of myself in it as well. Yeah. Do you know what was happening in the beginning? You were afraid you weren't going to get your needs met. Here's the good thing about control, right? Is that you don't, you no longer have to rely on control to get your needs met. Because yeah. there is a better way. And the better way is empathy. Mm. And that is first and foremost, it's self-empathy. Put yeah. my mask on. What are, what do I need? Now, how have I been trying to use control to get that need met? In what ways does it not work? Where does that fall apart? Oh, yeah, it's the bed and the desk. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to surrender the bed and the desk. That belongs to them now. I love that. And this is in one little acronym, S-E-C. -E yeah. And it has all this juicy stuff we can sit yeah. with and contemplate. I love yeah. it. It's literally slow down, take a sec, get the clarity protect your energy, get creative, and then go and have a fucking bath. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So I this love is a way that. to reclaim some bit of, of, of power. So you don't need to rely on control anymore. Now you have power. And you're also not relying on, like, so do they. They get to have power here too. Yes. Well, that's, that's, I'm definitely yeah. at that stage of my life, you know, with parenting where, um, I need to open up space for my kids to have a say yeah. in their lives and who they are. A autonomy. Exactly yeah. that. So and listen, wait, here's oh, the go. other thing as well. By the way, when one of the kids comes out and is like, oh, I can't find the thing that I left on my desk. You'd be like, not my circus, not my monkeys. That's your world. <laughs> yes. Your desk, your desk is your, I, you know, I, I surrendered that to you. Mm -hmm. That is your dominion. Ugh, that's motivating in itself. Yeah. I love that. So where are you going to leave the worksheet, Amanda, just so that listeners know? OK, so what you will do is in these show notes, there is a link to our sub stack. You are going to go to that link and then you are going to subscribe to the Road Back Home podcast. And the, all of that means is it's the exact same as subscribing to a newsletter. It's free. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do anything other than give your email address click the button, you will then receive an email from us to say, hello, welcome, delighted that you're here to follow us. And by the way, here's a link to your downloadable worksheet that's going to make it, it your life easier, give you clarity, protect your energy and use more creativity in your solutions and which honours, ultimately, which honours your commitment to your personal growth and well-being, which benefits well, everybody. I don't think we could ask for anything more than that. Yeah. So, yeah, that's it. That's all for now. I guess we'll chat again next week. And and yeah. as always, uh, you know, we encourage conversation, interaction, ask questions, leave comments, whatever you want to do. We are here for the conversation and we'll talk. Uh, we'll talk again next week. Now. Talk to you next week. Bye, Bye. man.